Welcome to Pre-AP World History Unit 1.1, Early Civilization. Uh, in today's lesson, we're going to uh, take a look at the way in which people lived uh, both before and after the Agricultural Revolution, uh, the time period. Uh, we want to look at uh, some of the features of civilizations, and then we will also move to uh, the Mesopotamia and uh, the Hebrews. Uh, and they are significant because of the first monotheistic faith, uh, Judaism. Okay, so prior to uh, the agricultural revolution, um, people were hunter gatherers, um, and archaeological records uh, indicate that uh, the first humans, modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, moved out of Africa. Um, and migrated uh, throughout the world to populate it. Um, one of the uh, dates that's most important is 10,000 BC uh, because after 10,000 BC we see that uh, people use uh, plants and animals so there's the domestication of plants and animals, the agricultural revolution but prior to that uh, people were hunter-gatherers, uh, they were nomadic uh, because they moved rather frequently because of their uh, food source. Um, and uh, there's little record of uh, the way in which they lived uh, because they did not put down permanent settlements. Right? And so much of what archaeologists were able to piece together from you know, surviving records that, that could be found, usually in caves, um, they indicate that they relied on very simple tools uh, and that because they were uh, hunter-gatherers there's little evidence of specialization and so the, the types of tools that they used or weapons were fairly simple, uh, rudimentary, and uh, the animals that they hunted um, provided not only food but also uh, clothing and um, helped with uh, their shelters. Uh, <clears throat> the um, time period 10,000 BC um, is important because this is the time period where people began to kind of stay in place uh, and it looks as if uh, Mesopotamia or the uh, Fertile Crescent uh, in the Middle East or Southwest uh, Asia is the location where that first takes place, and so we see the shift from uh, relying on uh, hunting and gathering as a way to feed uh, their people that they take on uh, farming, and uh, this is called domestication, domestication of plants and animals, and so the types of uh, crops that were domesticated were cereal grains, so we're looking primarily at uh, like wheat, barley, uh, and in other parts of the world later, uh, rice. But uh, the domestication of animals begins with the dog, uh, and then they move to other animals like sheep, uh, pigs, uh, chickens, and then uh, larger animals like oxen and horse. Horses and these larger animals uh, will be kind of referred to as beasts of burden because they could serve as pack animals, uh, that would help with uh, trade and uh, commerce, but then they also use these animals to help pull plows. Uh, and so this boosts the uh, productivity of the people. Um, one of the uh, problems, let me go back here, one of the problems with uh, the domestication of animals, though, is that uh, animal-based diseases become a problem uh, because they uh, usually housed uh, the animals in their own homes or very close by, so uh, this close proximity um, led humans to be susceptible to those diseases. Uh, over time, though, um, antibodies were, were built up, and so that became less of a problem. Um, one of the other changes that we see is that uh, because people had less diverse diets, um, they um, really had um, a problem with nutrition. And so the, I guess, skeletal remains that uh, have been found from 
people who were hunter gatherers to now the people who are uh, staying in one place for long periods of time, they noticed that they uh, they were shorter, and that um, is due to the fact that they had less diversity in their diet, and so uh, there is a, a connection between nutrition and uh, overall height of the people. Um, populations were allowed to grow because uh, food was much more reliable, uh, and in fact they could grow uh, a surplus of food, and so this allows uh, the most vulnerable uh, age groups, the young and the old, to uh, survive. Um, there's less infant mortality, uh, and the overall lifespan of people um, is extended. The um, other problem, I get not a problem, but one of the what are the effects with uh, domestication of plants and animals is that uh, people uh, grow a little bit uh, more slender. They're less muscled because um, they do not have to uh, move around and hunt and have to rely so much on their speed. Uh, so they uh, are, are less muscled. Um, when we talk about domestication of plants and animals, well, it's specifically animals. The dog was the first uh, animal to be domesticated, and that was for protection purposes. Uh, later, they move on to sheep, pigs, uh, chickens, and then the larger animals, uh, the beasts of burden, would be oxen and horses, and they helped with uh, transportation, uh, which helps with uh, trade and commerce, but then also the pulling of the plow, which boosts productivity, agricultural pro productivity, that much more. Um, we see as a result uh, of the surplus of food that specialization is allowed uh, to take place. And the first types of specialization um, ha uh, surround uh, how to uh, save and collect uh, excess food. And so uh, there is a development of certain types of vessels, uh, whether it's pottery or uh, baskets. Those seem to be some of the... Uh, first uh, types of, of jobs that are specialized, uh, weaponry as well, and then uh, we see more development with tools. Uh, and so once uh, metallurgy or the ability to use metals uh, and heat them to create tools and weapons takes place, uh, I guess that would be, would be considered blacksmithing. Um, uh, the invention of writing uh, is very important because now that is the time period that we refer to as uh, history uh, because before there was written record, uh, we refer to that as prehistoric, prehistory. The um, invention of uh, writing um, is also very important because that helps facilitate the formation of government and uh, laws and records uh, that will you know, assist a uh, society or civilization or city-state uh, in their day-to-day -day functioning. Um, here is some mention of how, because there's a growing population, kind of how those people are situated, um, and it, it kind of begins with the nuclear family, and that's pretty obvious parents and their offspring and then we have extended families where we have groups of families living together and they can all you know uh, look to a, a uh, common relatives there's blood relation be, be between them and the purpose of that uh, association is that it helps uh, with protection uh, primarily uh, but it also with uh, specialization there's more people to take on uh, different types of uh, of tasks or jobs, if you will. When we look at clans and tribes, uh, they're getting much larger, okay? And so uh, clans still can, uh, and, and so this will be uh, numerous families, so the numbers could be well into the hundreds, but they can still um, claim a common ancestor. But then we move to even a larger um, grouping, and that's called tribes. Uh, although some of them are related, not all are, obviously, but they do have common language oftentimes, and mo most importantly, they have uh, common uh, culture. And even at this 
early time period, we see suspicion of those people who are in rival tribes. And so there is automatically a, uh, a dislike of people who are different. Uh, when we look at the way in which um, justice is maintained uh, in these early societies, not yet civilizations, uh, it's fairly interesting to note that um, it was all based on this concept of conformity, uh, wh whatever that society's set of rules were, uh, they wanted to make sure that, that all people adhered to them, and though any time that there were uh, crimes against uh, people or, um, yeah, well, in speaking with crime, uh, crime more or less had to, or immoral behavior had to do with those who stepped outside of the, the norm and uh, didn't necessarily uh, follow their uh, prescribed way of doing things. But when we look specifically at justice, um, it was left up to the individual so that if somebody was a victim of a crime, um, they were allowed uh, to seek retribution. So revenge, if you will, was practiced in many early societies. Um, governments were fairly primitive, uh, nothing uh, like you would see in a, in a modern civilization, but um, they did have councils and, and typically there was a uh, type of democracy that existed which allowed uh, many of the, uh, the people to help uh, make decisions. Now, they did elect a chief and the chief usually made most of the important decisions, but if it uh, was a uh, large decision such as going to war, typically uh, it wasn't just the chief who made that decision. It was something that was opened up to more members of the, uh, of the tribe. When we look at <clears throat> religion, uh, at least initially, uh, nothing sophisticated, nothing complex, but there was a belief in animism, which uh, says that there is... Uh, spirits that exist and obviously they're not visible uh, to people but they do inhabit um, all living things and pretty much everything that exists in nature so animals uh, trees uh, rocks mountains um, rivers things like that and um, people believed that uh, those objects oftentimes assisted uh, the tribe uh, and especially the animals that they hunted, they believed that there was a, a spirit that lived within those animals. Um, <clears throat> the idea that uh, magic or that uh, nature can be manipulated to assist uh, the people, to benefit the people, was something that was common and it was practiced. Uh, so this idea of conjuring the spirit world to, to assist a tribe uh, was was common because they faced so many uh, difficulties along the way, um, especially like drought. Um, the idea that uh, the the spirit world world could be conjured to assist in that was uh, was commonplace. Uh, <clears throat> shifting gears here slightly, discussing uh, Jared Diamond. Uh, he is a uh, professor of uh, geography at UCLA. A, a man that uh, is uh, an author as well, and he first great, uh, gained fame when he wrote uh, a book known as, uh, or entitled uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and in it he really takes a look at uh, the full scope of human history and how certain societies and then civilizations have grown more advanced, and he postulates a theory that it's due to what he calls geographic luck. Now, geographic luck um, is this notion that because certain people, based on where they are lucky enough to live, have the benefit of better domesticated plants and animals, and uh, as a result of those better
better domesticated plants and animals. They were more successful at feeding their people, and as a result, uh, they more or less have a head start. And so when it comes to uh, specialization over time, they're able to develop better technology. And um, he uses uh, the people of Papua New Guinea, uh, a hunter-gatherer uh, society that, <clears throat> um, for all intents and purposes, are quite ingenious as hunters and uh, very effective in the way they live. And so he doesn't believe that there is any sort of... Uh, genetic deficiency that exists among these people, but rather um, they just haven't been able uh, to benefit from better do domesticated plants and animals, all right? And so uh, that theory aside, um, civilizations have uh, developed in the, the very first, the, the world's first civilization um, takes place in an area known as uh, the Fertile Crescent, which is in the Middle East, um, but specifically uh, an area known as Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers, and that's the Tigris and Euphrates. Um, that territory is in the modern-day country of Iraq, and um, what formed there uh, in this civilization were a number of uh, city-states. Um, I, I believe the number is 12. Um, and so uh, this Mesopotamian civilization uh, can be sometimes referred to as Samaria. That was uh, the very first, and then Babylonia after that. But um, <clears throat> these, this specific uh, civilization is known as a river civilization, and they relied very heavily on the river not only for uh, food, you know, like fish, but uh, because it flooded, it deposited um, silt on the shores, and then it was there that uh, the farming took place, and it uh, produced enough food that this uh, civilization could take off. Um, so when we look at some of these uh, basic uh, features of civilizations, population centers are one that's another name for a city, just a different way of looking at it. And some of the very first uh, cities uh, appeared near there, uh, Jericho and Katal Hayuk, and archaeologists have uh, found that there's uh, a lot of uh, interesting artifacts uh, including uh, this evidence of uh, religion. And uh, when we look specifically at these uh, female uh, statuettes, these small uh, statues that were revered and uh, they believe worshipped, these uh, earthen mothers uh, were worshipped because um, it was very important for these uh civilizations or these cities to have a uh, bountiful harvest and things like that. And so fertility was something that was um, very important to them for the survival of their cities. And so these fertility goddesses were created. Um, and the way in which they're depicted, uh, they have some exaggerated uh, features. Uh, these features would... Uh, I guess, be beneficial uh, with uh, reproduction and providing life. And so the idea behind the fertility goddess is the female uh, is unique uh, in that uh, she is capable of producing life. And there was a connection between uh, the idea that land provides life uh, through farming, through crops. And so uh, it was important for people uh, to worship uh, goddesses that could help uh, create uh, more bountiful harvests, okay? Um, other records uh, studying these cities, and we'll get into them, but there's a, there's a number of uh, inventions that we'll mention, but um, as a 
result of uh, staying in one place for a long period of time, complex religions were able to take place. Specialization, as we've already mentioned, uh, takes place. Government, more um, organized, and we'll, be, we'll see specifically record keeping how that aids in development of laws and they'll get away from this idea of retribution which early societies practice. Uh, we see a social hierarchy or a social ladder where those at the top um, have the most say and uh, occupy the most important positions within that society. So uh, a king, uh, religious figures, large landowners, etc. Um, and again, record keeping. Uh, the, the appearance of monumental architecture, uh, most typically uh, that would be like uh, religious temples like ziggurats, which we'll get into. And then we also see uh, advanced science and art. And we'll talk about some of the uh, inventions of the Mesopotamian people. Um, Trade and commerce, very important, especially for the people of Mesopotamia. That's a note there because uh, they didn't, they lacked actually some of the more important resources that they needed. So, uh, wood, uh, even various types of stone, and specifically uh, metals, they, they had to trade for those. Um, it's important to note that there are four uh, important river civilizations. So, Mesopotamia or uh, the Tigris and Euphrates, also the Nile, uh, which is in Egypt, and then you have the Indus River civilization uh, in uh, India, and then also the Yellow in China. Okay, so they all uh, have a number of uh, similarities. <clears throat> when we look specifically at the Fertile Crescent, uh, one of the things that's noteworthy is that it is not. Uh, protected by mountains or uh, larger bodies of water so uh, it was there were a, a, a number of people who could travel in and out including invaders and so that is a big part of this uh, region's history frequent wars um, frequent uh, civilizations toppling other civilizations uh, <clears throat> let's see Oh, yes, the use of bronze, uh, which, so we're looking at right around 3000 BC, the um, implementation of bronze, which was uh, very important because bronze um, is the culmination of um, uh, tin and um, uh, copper. And so this. Uh, metal could be sharpened, and so that made superior tools and uh, especially weapons. Uh, <clears throat> the other invention, so we have the invention of bronze, which is noteworthy, and that's important for the people of Mesopotamia, but also the invention of the pottery wheel. Uh, as mentioned earlier, it's very important to be able to uh, develop a vessel to, to store all sorts of things, but primarily agricultural products and, and just food. So pottery was very important. Um, the other would be the invention of writing, as we've already mentioned, and that's called cuneiform. And uh, the <clears throat> idea behind this is that you have clay tablets, and while they're still wet, you uh, use what's called a stylus, and... Uh, draw, if you will, uh, or make these impressions into the wet clay to create pictures. Um, eventually, they're going to shift uh, to a more, um, I guess, letters, uh, an alphabet, and that uh, the, the alphabet was more uh, efficient because with the creation of an alphabet, you can use words that symbolize pictures and ideas and so they don't have to write or draw a picture if you will for each idea that you wanted to communicate and so the development of an alpha the alphabet is just an improvement upon uh, cuneiform the other invention that's important is the invention of the wheel and uh, that's pretty self-evident uh, as the applications 
would allow for transportation uh, and allow society to uh, to improve. And so then with that will become, um, more importantly, um, the development of roads to help link uh, a civilization together. Um, all right, so when we look at uh, religion, uh, this plays a, in a very important role in Mesopotamia society because um, it was believed, as we said, that uh, gods needed to be worshipped because the there were spirits that existed. There was a spirit world that, uh, <clears throat> because there were so many challenges that went with living in Mesopotamia, uh, although... Uh, the rivers flooded. Uh, it was a fairly arid uh, region, and so they were very dependent upon the river. But the rivers uh, did not flood uh, regularly, nor were their floods um, controlled. Oftentimes, they were quite violent, and this wreaked havoc upon uh, upon the people. And so, they began to see this as a reflection of the gods, and that perhaps the gods were angry. And if the gods were angry, then they needed to be appeased. And so. Um, the uh, religious priest's job was to tend to their gods to make sure that their gods were kept happy. And one of the ways in which they did that was through animal sacrifice, as seen in this picture. Um, the idea of ethical conduct or righteous behavior uh, was not yet uh, seen in, in religion. Uh, that's a later uh, development, which we'll be getting to with the Hebrews. But the idea of, certainly the idea of the construction of temples, these multi-terrorist temples called ziggurats, um, makes sense because they were built, uh, and I'm sure over time, built taller and taller so that they could reach the heavens. Uh, that would be the, the, the domain of the gods, you know, in the heavens. And so they wanted to get as close as they could, so... They could uh, commune with the gods, uh, at least you know, for the, the priests. So uh, along with this come very complicated uh, rituals and things like that. And so that's why we use the word uh, religion uh, to describe this and not just animism. Um, and it's when we discuss religion within Mesopotamia, um, the literature or the story, the epic story of Gilgamesh, comes into play because there's this uh, back and forth between Gilgamesh and the gods, and he is uh, seeking eternal life. And what we see in this uh, long uh, story is how he is kind of toyed with, and that the, the gods uh, are not um, necessarily noble in all cases, that they are, in, in many cases, just like humans, and they... That, that comes complete with a lot of the, uh, the flaws that humans possess. So too did the gods. Although the gods did have special powers, they were not um, all powerful. Uh, there were limitations to their power. And all of this is conveyed, uh, or not all of this, but some of this is conveyed in the, the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it's from this uh, tale, that um, which is the earliest... Uh, recorded uh, story of any kind, uh, we learn that the Mesopotamian civilization is quite pessimistic in its outlook towards life. And a lot of that is uh, due to the, uh, I guess, the way in which um, the gods uh, unleash their wrath upon the people. And so um, that's just, you know, one of the important takeaways. But if you look uh, again, geographically, the way that they're, you know, where their civilization is located, kind of in the middle of a desert with two rivers that uh, flood uh, unpredictably and rather violently at times. Um, and because they are uh, the victim of frequent invasions, it makes sense that they would develop a uh, pessimistic uh, outlook towards life. And so that is the story of uh, Gilgamesh. A very another very important feature um, and of of the Mesopotamian society is the recording of a law code known as Hammurabi's Code, and this is named after obviously the god, not the god, the king, uh, King Hammurabi, 
But uh, this law code is, is fairly complex, fairly complete, deals not just with criminal law, but uh, civil law, and uh, I guess what we would refer to as a, a blanket term would be like business law, dealing with contracts and things like that. And, and the purpose of this is to provide order to a society, but it, it, it's also important because it is much larger, uh, and since it is much larger, it isn't practical for people to go out there and seek retribution for uh, crimes against them. That really, if that's done, can create a lot of um, uh, unrest, uh, and that can spread, and that can create chaos or anarchy and so it makes sense that the uh, that the king wants to prevent that and so uh, by placing you know laws or restrictions on people and that this is what the state will do to provide justice if you will um, it keeps people from taking the law in their own hands and so that's one that's the hallmark of civilized society uh, something else that's kind of noteworthy is that um, Hammurabi Hammurabi um, uh, says that he receives this law code from uh, from the gods, and so the what's important about that is is that the law is divine, uh, that it comes from God, and therefore, since it comes from the gods, it's incumbent upon the people to to follow it. Um, one of the more uh, important features of this law code is this element of social justice, all right? And it's kind of hard to find because at first, when you look at it, it looks unfair because there is a social hierarchy that exists in this society, and the law uh, treats people differently, okay? Uh, the, idea, the modern idea of social justice is that everybody is equal under the law, but um, the fact that the poor uh, and the powerless were protected at all. The that women, children, were uh, protected under the law is noteworthy uh, because there are there's evidence that in other civilizations uh, that doesn't take place. So uh, it does create um, it, it demonstrates that this law code is fairly uh, sophisticated. Being the very first, it's still very sophisticated with its element of uh, social justice. But again, it by our modern day standards, it would be seen as unfair, but um, th again, that the powerless in society are protected is noteworthy. Um, all right, I think that takes care of that. I wanna move on to um, the last segment here, and we'll get through this rather quickly. Uh, and that that is the, um, the development of, out of this region, uh, the Fertile Crescent, the development of the very first um, monotheistic faith. And this is to contrast with the people of Mesopotamia who were polytheistic. This is a monotheistic faith. And um, I guess the first and most noteworthy person, not the most, but at least from a human standpoint, he is the most noteworthy. And the father of the religion is uh, Abraham. And he moves... Uh, his people, they are pastoralist people, which means they're basically shepherds. And so they are nomadic, but um, he is moving his people for a religious purpose, and he is going to uh, where he is being directed to by uh, his God, God, Yahweh, and that is to the land of uh, milk and honey, where there will be, uh, it'll be the land of plenty for his people. And the idea behind this is that they're going to be taken care of. They're going to be provided for uh, by Yahweh if and only if they worship Yahweh uh, and no other gods. And so um, we want to mention this idea of a, uh, compa uh, of a, of a contract uh, that is entered into a covenant uh, between um, the Hebrews and Yahweh. And the idea is that they will worship him and follow his law code or whatever it is that he asks, and that in return they'll be protected and they will be his chosen people. Um, one of the more noteworthy uh, ideas behind this faith is that there isn't really a very sophisticated or uh, clearly defined concept of an afterlife, um, which is uh, interesting because it's out of this religion that we get uh, Christianity, and obviously, uh, 
the central um, dogmatic beliefs within Christianity is the, the idea of, of an afterlife, of paradise, and how one goes about uh, attaining that afterlife. But with Judaism, their, I guess, uh, payoff or what it is that they get uh, out of uh, following and believing and having a faith in Yahweh is more immediate, and that's protection in this life. If we were to take one step forward and look at Christianity, there is no guarantee of uh, protection or a good life uh, with Christianity. In fact, the argument can be made that it's quite the opposite, that if you are going to be a Christian, um, your life is going to be full of travails. At any rate, um, getting back to Judaism and the discussion with Abraham, um, what one of the more noteworthy uh, stories uh, within uh, the book of uh, Genesis, the the very first book of the Old Testament, um, that book is very or that the Old Testament is important to the Jews, specifically the first five books known as the Torah. That's the uh, and and the notes get into that later and I'll discuss those but but in Genesis um, God orders Abraham to sacrifice his uh, eldest son Isaac and to take him and to um, sacrifice him as burnt offerings to Yahweh and he's testing Abraham and Abraham complies and but right before his son is to come under the knife, uh, God sends uh, an angel down and stops him. And this is very noteworthy, um, as I'll get into in just a moment, about this faith, what's unique about this faith, and how it's different from the polytheistic faiths of Mesopotamia. Uh, another important figure is Moses, uh, who uh, is responsible um, for leading the people uh, at this time, they're now known as Israelites, out of Egypt where they had been enslaved, and he leads them back to the um, the land of milk and honey, which is uh, Judea um, or Israel. Uh, it's known as the Holy Land, and um, Moses is instructed uh, by God to tell. Uh, the uh, Pharaoh of Egypt to let his people go, and that if they, if, if he doesn't, that they will be, uh, there will be ten plagues visited upon them. And this uh, is interesting because it is through this story that we learn that, uh, that Yahweh, that God is all powerful, um, and that He is not of this world, but that His there are no limits to His power. Um, especially where Moses uh, is able to part the Red Sea to allow the uh, Israelites to escape Egypt. Um, so that, again, uh, indicates and shows that uh, God, this, is a, is there, this is different. This is a different type of God. This is a different type of religion because he is all-powerful. All right? Um, so with the uh, Ten Commandments, that, that's not necessarily unique in that there are laws that one must follow, but the, um, what specifically the Ten Commandments order is unique, and it's here where the uh, religion of Judaism differs from previous religions, and it is uh, the, the, the call to ethical or righteous behavior. And um, going back to the story of Isaac, and or Abraham and Isaac, and that he did not sacrifice his son, uh, but rather s sacrificed a, uh, a ram. Uh, instead, indicates that God is not pleased or appeased necessarily by blood. That it's um, testing people to see if they will uh, have faith that they if they will stay the course and so the Ten Commandments really set down um, morality and um, this is as I said a unique feature of this faith and then one of the other things um, that we see 
throughout the Old Testament in the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, that's Gen uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is the presence of prophets. And these are people who God selects and speaks to so that they can serve as reminders to the, uh, the other Jews that they have a responsibility for social justice, and that is that they have to take care of the powerless. And because um, so often mankind, because uh, our humankind, humans are flawed, that they need uh, to be reminded of their uh, uh, obligation to take care of the poor, to take care of the sick, to take care of the, uh, the powerless. And so that is the role that the prophets serve. And again, that is what makes this uh, religion uh, unique. And so that uh, theme of social justice is much more present um, in uh, Judaism than it was uh, in Mesopotamia. And that is all for today. Thank you.